Today's session is Social Return on Investment, Capturing Value and Values. It's brought to you by the Canadian Community Economic Development Network. We're a national network of several hundred community organizations and individuals working to create local economic opportunities that support an inclusive and sustainable economy. Here you can see a few of our members' logos. If you like the session today, consider joining us by becoming a member or signing up for our free e-newsletters. Today's webinar is part of a series. Past sessions include topics such as the versatility of co-ops, the resilience imperative, social impact bonds, financial management for sustainability, mutuals for microfinance, and many others. All of these past sessions are on our website. We also have an upcoming session on April 18th on ongoing social economy research across the country, which has assembled a truly amazing lineup of researchers who will be sharing the latest findings from their projects, so I encourage you to check that out. The session today is divided into, divided into two parts. To start, we'll have a presentation by Anne that will last about 30 minutes. Then in the second part, I'll ask her the questions you've posed in the chat box. But before we get to the presentation, let's get a sense of who we have on the webinar today with two quick polls of participants. You should see two polls pop up on your screen inquiring about your familiarity with SROI and what you think the benefits of SROI are. Hopefully by the end of the session I'll know how to say that. <laughs> well, and so while you answer those, let me do my intro for the session. I have to confess that I owe some royalties to Sherry Torchman of the Caledon Institute for the title of the session. It was the punchline, actually, of the commentary she gave to Jeremy Nichols' keynote address on SROI at last fall's Social Finance Forum. But I thought it captured brilliantly what SROI can offer by moving the discussion around programs and services from cost to value. In CED, attributing a value to the impacts of our work has been a long-standing challenge. How do we explain to funders, stakeholders, and partners the value of what we do? We've done a pretty good job of telling stories, but the numbers have not always been as compelling. Fortunately, in recent years, evaluation methods that try to capture the impact of interventions in complex environments have become increasingly sophisticated. One of those is social return on investment. Through rapid development in the last decade, SROI has refined a process that allows users to attribute financial values to some of the costs saved by our work. By assigning financial proxies or monetary value to social, environmental, and economic outcomes, SROI creates a more complete understanding of the value generated by an initiative, especially multifaceted, preventative, or developmental initiatives like SEDNET members often undertake. So I'm very pleased that Anne has agreed to present this approach to us today. But before we begin our presentation, let's have a look at the responses to our polls. It looks like the majority of people on the webinar have heard of SROI but don't have a lot of experience. We do have a few people who have been involved in conducting one, which is terrific, and a few people who haven't been exposed at all. And the benefits are for forecasting value primarily, but uh, also process and practice improvement following closely behind as the numbers evolved in communication, and not so much for fundraising, which is uh, interesting. Good. So. <clears throat> It's my pleasure to introduce Ann Miller. Ann is team lead of the SROI initiative at Simpact Strategy Group and one of the first SROI accredited practitioners in Canada. She's involved in the SROI networks both in Canada and internationally and has worked on more than 20 SROI analyses in the fields of justice, Indigenous people studies, social housing and homelessness, community development and public health. Thank you for joining us, Ann. Thank you. So can you start with an overview of what you're going to present today? Sure. Um, I've got a little slide here on the agenda. So um, I'll just go through a quick introduction of uh, what SIMPACT does in our work in SROI. Uh, and then we'll go into kind of that question of what is SROI and what, how do we define SROI and what is it used for. Uh, then we're going to actually get into kind of understanding what that SROI process looks like, uh, specifically around um, that valuation piece, because I think that's where most people have a lot of interest. Uh, then we'll go into some examples of how SRI is being used in Canada. Uh, and at the end, we can talk a little bit about the SRI Canada network and what's going on there. 
Sounds good. So you're going to start with some introduction. Yeah. So Simpact Strategy Group um, works in a number of different areas. On, in one part of the business that I am the team lead for, we do social return on investment consulting with individual projects. Uh, we also do consulting around um, strategic investment, and we do training for social return on investment. Uh, on the other side, uh, the flagship project is the LBG Canada Group, uh, which is the London Benchmarking Group of Canada. And it's a group of companies, big companies in Canada, that have community investment portfolios and want to know what those community investment portfolios look like year on year. And so we do like an audit benchmarking process for them to help them compare within sectors, help them to compare year on year, and help them really understand what their community investment looks like in terms of you know, community volunteering and things like that. Uh, so we've got kind of both sides from the corporate and from the community side. And then Simpact Strategy Group is also a founding network partner of the SRI Canada Network. And we're currently the secretariat for that network, so we're providing kind of back-end and administrative support for the network and working on building that out uh, so that it's really a national network where this methodology can be discussed and developed. It's an approach or an area of work that uh, an increasing number of people recognize is uh, quite innovative and vital. Eh? Yeah, very much so. Um, so this slide here shows kind of a bunch of different areas where we've seen this um, interest in this. So there are, there's private sector um, interest. We've seen this amongst uh, quite a few of those LBG Canada companies who are already in, interested in what their community investment looks like, so actually measuring the value and impact of that community investment. We've seen it from the public sector, from a bunch of different government agencies looking to start valuing in this way. Then we've also seen it from the third sector and different organi organizations coming forward to want to speak about their work in a different way and want to be able to communicate that value in a different way. Um, so we're really seeing it all across the board. So I just see in the chat box Penny Rowe from the Community Services Council of Newfoundland and Labrador has just completed a pilot project at SROI with 13 groups. So it, it is taking off across the country. Yeah, and Penny gave a really great presentation at that Pondish Bande Center um, conference last week around what that experience has been. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to see all of those projects and the different um, how those analyses turned out in each of those individual situations. Excellent. So let's get into uh, the topic. What, specifically, can you give us a definition of what is social return on investment? Uh, so social return on investment, um, some people kind of see it as a cost-benefit analysis. It actually goes beyond the regular cost-benefit analysis in that you're looking at a broader um, sense of that value. So you're including social value and you're including environmental value. There's also a significant focus on involving stakeholders and understanding value from stakeholders' perspective um, that's included in the SRI methodology and is part of each step of that methodology. And then it's also a bit different from a cost-benefit analysis in that SRI will actually allow for the valuation of avoidance of alternative outcomes. So if you have individuals changing their behavior to go down one path and they're achieving certain outcomes, are they actually avoiding some other outcomes? And is there actually a value to them avoiding those other outcomes? And so SRI allows for the valuation of the avoidance of alternative outcomes. Hmm. So what can uh, SRI do? What would people use it for? Uh, so SRI is being used in all sorts of different ways. Um, primarily, it's this idea of assigning value to social change. Um, it's also a great way to enhance communications, to create a bridge between the language that's spoken in community organizations and the good work that's going on in communities, and then the language that's spoken increasingly by government, in the private sector, in the community more broadly around kind of those numbers and those dollar figures. Um, SRI can be used to forecast the potential value of something that you're looking to set up so you can see where you're going to focus your energies and you can use that uh, going forward to make a business case or to look for investment. Um, SRI can also be used to evaluate what's been going on already in a program and what the value of that has been. 
Um, and when you're doing that evaluation, and even when you're doing that forecasting, SRI really leads into this idea of improving processes and practice. So it's really a detailed look at all the ins and outs of what's going on in an organization and how that's creating value. And then you're able to actually um, go in and make sure that you're enhancing that value and that you can actually improve processes by doing that. There may be some misconceptions when people hear about return on investment in numbers about what it is and it isn't. Can you just contrast that? Uh, so SROI is really a framework and a methodology for looking at social value. Um, a lot of people kind of grab onto it and say, oh, we're going to have ratios for every single program. We can decide what to invest in based on that. Uh, and it's not a tool for comparison of ratios. There's a number of different reasons why a ratio might be different. It is a way of kind of creating that communications hook, a way of understanding value, but it's not meant to be a calculator or something for just comparing ratios. Um, it would be like saying, um, this is the cost of a house. Do you want to buy it? You would come back and say, well, where is that house? What neighborhood is it in? How many bedrooms does it have? Does it have a backyard? Is it near a school? You need to know the whole context and not just that number. So it's one more tool to help um, not only organizations themselves and funders, but other partners to better understand the value that's generated by a service. Definitely, yeah. Um, and so it's not uh, meant to replace current evaluation practice using logic models and evaluation plans and evaluation tools, but it can definitely be a part of that evaluation process where you're using your evaluation tools to get all those survey results and all that data, and you're feeding that into your SRI to see how that um, creates value and how that's representative of social value through, that you've created. Um, and so, that, sorry. Today. Did you have a question? I was just going to say, and so uh, where are things at today with SROI in Canada and internationally? Yeah, so um, the SROI methodology um, has been significantly developed in the UK, um, and the international network is located in the UK, and people still get accredited through the UK. Um, but it's also started to spread around the world. There's networks in Germany, in Australia. Um, we've heard some emergence of different things in Japan. And the SRI Canada network is starting to develop as well. So as more and more individuals get accredited within Canada, we'll be able to run that accreditation process all inter internally within Canada and develop the methodology um, to actually respond to the Canadian context. So you've described SROI as a, an approach to enhance evaluation and uh, practice. Can you describe the, how that process works? Yeah, so um, SROI has been set up kind of like accounting in that it's a principles-based approach. Uh, so if three different individuals looked at the same program, they might not get exactly the same ratio, uh, but that ratio would probably be fairly similar and you would be able to go back and identify where decisions were made and how they were made based on this principles approach. And the very first principle in SRI is involving stakeholders, so really understanding change from the stakeholder's perspective. And everything in SRI kind of flows from that. Um, I think another principle that's really, really important in SRI is that principle of never overclaiming. Um, so that in every step of the process, there are kind of checks to ensure that when you get to the end, you don't have some sort of inflated or overclaimed ratio. Are there key questions or principles that guide that, uh, that approach? Yeah, so once we get going into the actual SRI process, it kind of starts out like an outcomes-based evaluation where you're looking at who changes, you're being really clear about who those different stakeholders are and who's experiencing change because of a program. Um, and then you're, you're asking the question of what happened to them. So how did they change? And what might otherwise have happened to them? So that idea of alternative outcomes. Um, then we're also looking at how are we going to measure that change? What are the metrics that we need in place and the evaluation tools that we need to be able to measure all those changes that we've identified? Uh, and then it goes into some of the SRI stuff, those last two questions there. So what is the change worth? That is really uh, the central question around SRI. How are we going to assign 
financial proxies to all those outcomes that we've identified so we can talk about the social value of achieving those outcomes or avoiding those alternative outcomes. And then that idea of what would have happened without the intervention. So this is kind of um, that idea again of those alternative outcomes, but it's also the idea of never overclaiming. So being really clear that maybe some individuals would have made some of those changes anyway, and if we can identify that, we discount the value to make sure that we're not overclaiming, to make sure that if someone else was part of creating that change, that we're acknowledging that and that we're not claiming their value, essentially. Hmm. Um, you've broken down the process into six steps. Yeah, and this is sort of where uh, the international methodology has broken it down into these six steps. Uh, so it starts with establishing the scope and identifying those stakeholders um, and developing a theory of change summary statement that would capture what that looks like. And when we're, lo when we're talking about scope, we're talking about time frame, we're talking about who's involved, how much investment, all that kind of stuff. Then we go into actually mapping out those outcomes. It's kind of like a logic model, uh, but it's actually probably more detailed in some ways and in other ways we're kind of grouping outcomes together where we're not breaking them out into short, medium, and long-term outcomes. Then once you have all those outcomes mapped out, you figure out how you're going to measure those and evidence them and which ones are going to get assigned a financial proxy or a value. Once you've done that, you go through and determine whether you're going to discount for different things like the change attributable to others, uh, the change that might have happened anyway, whether there was anything positive displaced in the process of the change that you made, uh, and whether if you're claiming that the change that individuals in your program have experienced uh, continues into the future, whether that change drops off over time as it continues into the future. Then there's all the SRI calculations that's looking at um, all the total value that's created versus um, the investment that's been made. And then there's the reporting and using, embedding into current practice and enhancing practice and communicating those results to funders or to the community or to whoever is interested. Uh, so one of the um, steps I think that individuals get really interested in when we're talking about SRI is this um, evidencing outcomes and giving them a value. So when we go into that, um, it's this idea of assigning financial proxies to outcomes that you would see achieved. And some financial proxies might be really direct, and you know directly, you know, that's somebody's savings, and they saved X number of dollars, that's money in their pocket, and it's really direct. Other times it's a little more indirect, and there's some different sort of methods to look into how to assign financial proxies and develop those financial proxies. So when we're looking at assigning those financial proxies, we're assigning them to the value created from outcomes that are achieved. We're assigning them to um, avoiding alternative outcomes. And if somebody doesn't go down that alternative path, are there actually, is there actually a value to avoiding that alternative path? And then throughout the process, it's looking at this value from the stakeholder's perspective. Now, there's a couple of places where um, there's like databases to find these financial proxies. And so um, SRI Canada administers a financial proxy database that has all Canadian financial proxies, and it's free. And if um, you want to be signed up for it, you can go to the SRI Canada website. It's at the end of the presentation here. Uh, it's sri-canada.ca. Um, and you can sign up to have access to that database to see what's in there. Um, individuals can also contribute to the database. And so it's building as individuals start using SRI. Out of the UK, there's also the Wikivoice database. It's kind of like a Wikipedia idea where all sorts of different people are contributing to it. Um, and it's also this idea of building out ideas around financial proxies and how different indicators and measures can be used and then um, assigned with financial proxy. Perhaps it would help people understand better if you gave a, a specific example in terms of values attributed in the, through SROI. Sure. Um, so some examples might be, so in one uh, case study that we did in Calgary around a youth health center, uh, different financial proxies were identified in different kind of pockets. So um, some of the youth that were coming to the health center had children, and there was a value to ensuring that those youth got addictions treatment so that um, their child was not born with FASD, that sort of thing. Um, 
the youth were also being hooked up with entitlements, and which from their perspective is a huge, huge benefit um, in terms of how they're able to uh, gain independence in their lives and move forward in their lives. Um, and so getting those sorts of entitlements from their perspective is really a huge social value. There was also value in the work that this health center did with uh, youth coming out of remand, and there was value around their health, obviously, because it was a health center, but it wasn't just those health values. It was all sorts of different values that came from the outcomes that this youth health center was achieving. And so altogether, these different types of values help tell a better story, I guess, of that intervention. Yeah, and SRI also helps tell that story kind of horizontally across different funders and different ministries, where it really shows how one change in one area of somebody's life can affect all sorts of different areas of their life and all sorts of different people that they interact with in their lives. Uh, so you actually get a broader picture of, you know, even if it's a, a justice program or a youth program, the fact that those programs actually touch on a number of different areas in the social sphere. Do you have another example? <laughs> um, so I have another slide here uh, that's an example from Toronto, um, and I'm going to actually walk through a whole bunch of different types of examples in a minute here. Um, this is, again, just kind of illustrating that, yes, in the end, you do get that number, but not everything can be assigned a financial proxy necessarily, um, and not all of that value is getting captured in that number all the time, and so it's really about that context, about that story, and then using that number as a hook to really have people understand that there is value, but usually that number is a minimum number, and the value goes beyond what that ratio is actually going to be able to demonstrate. So it's the old adage that not everything that counts can be counted. Yeah, exactly. But at least SROI goes a long way to putting more numbers to some of the value of the changes that our programs are carrying out. Definitely. So you mentioned um, some examples about SROI and how it's being used. Yeah, um, so through our work, we've, um, we've seen SRI being used in a number of different ways. I think that it's really, really applicable to um, community economic development um, in that you're touching all sorts of different areas, um, and there's different programs that are doing different aspects of that work, um, and it really affects the entire community, and there's value usually for the entire community. Um, when we're looking at specific examples, uh, there's individual sort of case studies that can be done you know, as an evaluation. They can be done as a forecast. Uh, the ones pick, uh, depicted here, one is a residence for pregnant and parenting uh, adolescents that is kind of part forecast, part evaluation, where they had some evaluation data um, but not everything that needed to go into the SRI. So they forecasted some of it, used some of their evaluation data, and then are able to, in the future, uh, develop evaluation tools to do it on an ongoing basis as an evaluation. Uh, the one in the middle there was a straight-up forecast where um, an Aboriginal women's center in Ottawa was hoping to uh, find funding to also provide addictions treatment services for Aboriginal women that would be trauma-informed and culturally sensitive, and that where those women would be able to bring their children to the addictions treatment center, which isn't usually the case. Um, and so they forecasted the value there to be able to demonstrate that if they added this service, what would that look like in their community and who is going to be affected and what's the value of that? Uh, and then the third one on there is Women Moving Forward in Toronto where they evaluated um, the different aspects of their program and where the women from those programs ended up um, in their lives because of that program and what's the value of that. Are all of these available on your website? Yes. Um, so you can go to simpactstrategies.com. Um, the Humewood House one might not be. If you email me, I can send you these ones and, and others, and they should all be up on the website really soon anyway. I know for sure Min Wash and Lodge and um, Women Moving Forward are both up there. Okay. Um, we also had a really interesting project recently uh, with the City of Calgary where their asset management department got interested in this idea of SROI. So they had kind of an aging asset in the inner city that's a recreation center. And they, if they're looking at it from a purely asset management perspective, the asset management department said, 
that's a really expensive place to run because it's aging, because it's in the inner city. It would actually be cheaper for us to just rip it down, build something out in the suburbs, or build something you know, downtown somewhere else, uh, and move forward. And so they actually asked us to come in and take a look at what the impact of that would be. So socially, when you actually look at that aspect, uh, asset. It's in an area where there are a lot of low-income seniors, and there's a lot of at-risk youth in that area. And so the programming that was going on at that particular recreation center actually had a lot of social value in the community. And in discussions with the stakeholders, it was clear that if that asset wasn't in their community, um, if it got moved to the suburbs, if it got ripped down and built again, you know, within five years or something, they would actually lose that value in the community. And so when they took a look at it in this different way, it actually made sense to keep that recreation center open because the value it was creating in the community was so much more than just the cost of maintaining that asset. So it's really moving that conversation from cost to value. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, in the UK, we've also seen um, some all sorts of different reports coming out. I really um, enjoyed this report that came out last year where it looked at the value of women's services in a particular area of the UK. And they looked at that value by looking at a bunch of different, completely different women's services. And they all came out with different SRI ratios, but they were able to talk about that in terms of the value of that sector and the range of value that's created through addressing women's issues um, in their community. Uh, the region of Waterloo has also recently done some similar work around their homelessness prevention strategy, and I know they're about to release their report on what that looked like in terms of the range of value when you're addressing homelessness for youth, for women, for men. Um, and so I would check uh, on their website uh, in the new, near future, I think in the next couple of weeks, uh, they'll be putting up their report that we um, help them put together. Um, sorry. Yeah, and you have some examples also from Canada of different types of investments that you supported or analyzed? Yeah, um, so Simpact is located in Calgary, and we've um, been involved in a really big project from the Justice Department in Alberta. So when our current premier was Minister of Justice, she um, helped pull together $60 million across a bunch of different ministries to invest in pilot crime prevention initiatives. And each of these initiatives was going to be a three-year sort of funding cycle. Um, and after that, they were hoping that you know, some of those projects might go out and find their own investment, or they'll be able to demonstrate whether or not these crime prevention initiatives do different things in the community. So they asked each of the 88 projects that they funded to do an SRI, along with uh, their other evaluation work that they were doing. And they contracted SIMPACT to train those projects and to also help um, everyone understand the methodology, help share knowledge across those different sectors. And so um, the first round of funding is just kind of coming to a close now. And it's been really interesting to see how different sectors have been able to share financial proxies. You know, if, if there's a bunch of projects working in domestic violence, they've been able to demonstrate change in a certain way and demonstrate value in a certain way. And as those projects are coming to a close, they're able to move forward with that SRI, those SRI results to look for other funders or to demonstrate back to justice that it's really worth their while to continue this sort of investment. It's also given the opportunity to show that an investment from justice um, actually has impact across different ministries, so in mental health and in health. And all across and in education, kind of all across different ministries, there's value that's being created. So it helps kind of validify that idea that you should pull together across different ministries to work towards outcomes that you're seeking in your province or in your in your country. Yeah, it's an extremely valuable tool to help you know continue to beat down the government silos and yeah. promote horizontality in government, which is the, what the integrated community-based approaches are all about. Mm -hmm. So we've also done a little bit of research around um, the experiences of using SRI. Um, so last year, HRSBC funded a study that we did around you know, people's experience. Um, so a lot of people who were using SRI uh, found that it was great for communicating value and understanding outcomes. 
uh, program delivery and improvement. These were all sorts of things that we had already identified as things that were probably good benefits to SRI. One thing that came out of it that I was really interested in that I hadn't even really considered was that um, some organizations indicated that it, it increased their staff morale. So staff that were in the organizations that had gone through the process and had this, these SRI results to go forward with felt better about speaking about the value of their work. And so they knew the good work in their community, but they were then able to speak about it in a different way that actually increased um, their feelings of well-being around that, which I find just so interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and the, some of that reflects uh, the poll results we saw at the beginning of the webinar as well. Mm -hmm. um, so additional resources. Yeah, so um, the SRI Canada Network is uh, developing. Hopefully it will move forward quite more quickly this year than it has in the past years. Uh, and it's intended to be sort of a methodology hub for developing the SRI methodology in Canada. So there's that financial proxy database that individuals can sign up for. Uh, the SRI Canada Network also facilitates accreditation training. Um, so if individuals are wanting to go forward and become accredited practitioners of SRI, they can attend this two-day training course, which is actually a course that's directly taken from the UK network and sanctioned by the UK network. Uh, you take the two-day training course, and then you do your own SRI case study and submit that back to the UK uh, for assessment, um, and then if they approve that and show, and you've demonstrated that you understand all the SRI principles and are able to use them, then you can become an accredited practitioner. So these two, these training courses, um, usually they're run in Eastern Canada and Western Canada kind of in the spring and in the fall. The spring courses have been scheduled for Ottawa uh, on May 9th and 10th, and Saskatoon on June 3rd and 4th. And SIMPACT is actually uh, teaching these courses this round. Sometimes they bring in individuals from the UK, um, or sometimes it might be another organization within Canada that would be teaching this course. Um, so if you want more information, you can go to the SRI Canada website and look into um, how to sign up for that accreditation training. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan has also recently done um, a lot of proxy research in Saskatchewan, and so um, they're presenting this new financial proxy research on June 5th in Saskatoon and June 6th in Regina, um, and that should be posted on the website soon. Um, and they're going to speak about the process of determining those financial proxies, and they're also going to talk about the different types of proxies that they've found. And all those proxies are going to end up in the financial proxy database um, through SRI Canada. Um, SRI Canada also does um, speaking engagements at different conferences. Uh, Soon, hopefully, a practitioner database will be up on the SRI Canada website. There's been quite a few submissions, and it just kind of needs to be um, structured and put in place. And then the SRI Canada network is linked internationally to the SRI network um, so that we're all working from the same methodology as there are developments um, internationally that translates into the SRI Canada network. As there are things that are locally more relevant in Canada, we're able to discuss those things and um, feed that into the international system as well. Very good. So I think that, that wraps up your presentation. Yeah. And you're right on time, nicely done. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so we'll move into the question and answer period of the webinar. Okay. And um, <clears throat> there you have the links for the SROI Canada website and Simpac Strategies. Uh, there are already a few questions that have been posted in the chat room, and so I'll invite other people to type your questions there, and uh, I'll go through them. We have a good chunk of time now for the Q&A. And there was an awful lot of material covered in the presentation, and the questions will undoubtedly be wide-ranging, but don't hesitate to post them, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I, in a moment, I'll unsync the presentation, but before I do so, I'm just going to back up to address one question of clarification that uh, Karen asked around this graph. Are those numbers there uh, by numbers or percentage of SRI benefits reported? You know They're by percentage, I think. Percent. Yeah. Okay. And I think individuals were allowed to answer more than one, like they didn't have to select one particular. Right. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so what I'll do now is 
I'll unsync the presentation so uh, each of each everyone on the webinar should be able to scroll back and forth through the slides yourselves to go back and have another look at the ones that you wanted to see more closely and we'll uh, go ahead with questions um, I think the, the first question that was asked in the chat box is one that I, I think gets to the heart of uh, some of the challenges and the, the value of SROI is who determines the values, Medin asked. Uh, in the example of the Youth Health Center, the stakeholders are identified and are those the uh, clients, the, are they the youth, the staff, or the both? Uh, how do you differentiate which values are more valuable? How do you generate those values uh, in uh, slide 27, I guess it is? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so that's a huge part of this whole SRI process. So determining the stakeholders. And um, in the principles, there's the principle of only including what's material. And there's some guidance around materiality. So determining how far out you're going to go is part of that materiality. So is it just the participants in the health center? Is it those participants and their families and potentially their children? Is it the whole community? Um, so when we're doing that, we'll go through and interview all sorts of different stakeholders to see how material that change is to them and to also ask them who else they think in their lives might have experienced change because they were experiencing change. Um, then when we go to assign financial proxies, uh, it's the same sort of process where you're determining if it's a material change, if it's actually something that's impacting the community, impacting those individuals, it's a significant value. We'll usually ask stakeholders, you know, what was the most valuable thing for you in this process uh, or in this program that you've participated in so that they can identify themselves, you know, whatever piece was most valuable. And then we can make sure that that gets valued in the analysis. Even if it's something that's hard to value, if that's the most valuable thing to stakeholders, we really want to make sure that that's in the analysis. Um, and it's also going back to those questions of materiality. So um, how material is the value that you've, um, that you've analyzed in this? And is it relevant to the case study that you're doing? So you don't necessarily have to count everything. You don't have to go down to the most minute detail or out to the nth degree of individuals that are going to be affected or even the time frame of how long people are going to be affected, but determining what's most relevant and what's most material and analyzing that. That's the art of this and the science of the, uh, the methodology, I suppose. Yeah, that's the challenge, the real challenge, I think, all the time. Excellent. Patricia Allen Clark asked if you have done any um, SROI studies in the field of early childhood in, with the children, say, zero to five years? Uh, we haven't. I know under the Safe Communities uh, Secretariat, there might have been some early childhood uh, programs that were analyzed. Um, yeah, and if you send me an email, I can probably look through some different materials and see if we have anything on that. Um, I haven't personally been involved in any of those, but um, it definitely is an area that would be a really good fit for SRI since it has those long-term impacts and that it's actually changing kind of those paths that individuals might take in their lives. Uh, Robin Hugendam from the Learning Urgement Foundation in Toronto did mention in the chat box that they did an SROI back in 2007-2008 with their, they have an extensive network of child care centers in Toronto. Um, and so we'll connect uh, Patricia and Robin around those. Robin also seems to say there might be a bit uh, other resources from the U.S. So. Awesome. That's great. Um, <clears throat> who maintains the SROI Canada network? So currently, SIMPAC Strategy Group is the secretariat for the network. So we're doing kind of all that back-end uh, administrative stuff in terms of getting the website going and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's developing, and they're working on, so there's kind of a, a working group around um, SRI Canada that involves uh, the Saskatchewan Abilities Council, uh, the Mars Center for Impact Investing, and uh, the network is looking into getting other partners. Um, so there's, in the city of Calgary, there's kind of a, a network of individuals that are working on putting that forward and getting it established as a charity um, and all that sorts of, sort of stuff. So in the meantime, we're just kind of, we're administering the, the network, uh, but that's moving out of impact hopefully within this year. 
Um, I guess somewhat related to that, Natalie asked whether or not nonprofit agencies can complete their own SROI. Earlier you mentioned that access to the financial proxy database is free for people who want to register. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the question is, is there, is that something that can be done internally or should be, they be evaluated independently? What's been your experience with that? Uh, they can definitely be done internally. Um, I would just make sure that there's enough resource around, you know, evaluation and evaluation capacity for that. Uh, there's also the potential to kind of get some capacity building training or something like that within organizations. We've done that in a number of different organizations so that they can move forward and do their own SRI work um, or for them to do SRI work and to find um, an accredited practitioner or an SRI practitioner just kind of generally in their area to verify that result with or to verify the process with um, so that they're supported along the way. But it's definitely possible to do it internally, especially if you've got strong um, evaluation capacity already. And I suppose if one of the objectives is to be able to strengthen processes and practice in an ongoing way, then developing uh, some capacity internally will allow for that ongoing process to be sustained. Yeah. Um, and if you're concerned about, you know, sort of having a third party um, just to make sure that it's not biased or anything like that, you can also, um, if you're doing SRI internally, you can get that assured through the um, international SRI network. So you can send that, those final results results and that report to the international network for them to assess it and to make sure that all those decisions uh, really made sense and to kind of put that stamp of official sort of third party on it to say that it's a valid SRI study. Alternative. Um, here's a question from Maddie in BC. Would it be fair to say that SROI assists with translating values and principles experienced as a result of the program or service into actual business requirements? I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. So you're, um, in terms of sort of things you're planning on achieving business-wise, like if you're a social enterprise, is that, or like social impact bond sort of idea? Yeah, perhaps um, Maddie could try to clarify what uh, she means by the business requirement section in the chat box, and we can come back to that because uh, that isn't clear for, for me as well. But I think it does pull together financial values for the, um, for the initiatives or the interventions. And then I think one of the objectives you mentioned earlier was to help build a business case. Uh, is that right? Mm. Yeah, yeah so, so you can definitely use those results to say, if, um, if this program is established, this is the value that it's going to have in the community. And you can use that kind of as a business case going forward. I know a lot of those um, projects in Alberta under the Alberta Safe Communities um, Fund were able to use some of their SRI results in their business case. It wouldn't replace an entire business case, but it is kind of a piece in there that you can say, we can demonstrate results, we can demonstrate value, and this is what we've discovered in our analysis through um, the SRI methodology. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a question from William there is, is how well SROI is being accepted by the professional accounting community. Uh, usually, it's a, from what his comment is, that SROI is usually an elective course in traditional management schools. I know um, when I listened to Jeremy Nichols, who is with the SROI UK network at the Social Finance Forum last fall, he started out by saying, I believe he was originally an accountant, mm -hmm. and so it emerged out of accounting. Can you talk a bit about the relationship between accounting and SROI? Yeah, so it did emerge out of accounting. Um, it's obviously a much, much newer methodology, uh, but it's still that kind of principles-based approach like accounting. Um, we've had the experience of presenting SRI results to different um, boards when we're going through these, this process with different community organizations. And it's really interesting the types of questions you get from the accounting type of and finance types of individuals. And usually they're pretty um, on board with the process that has been used. And because a lot of kind of the technical pieces of it are taken directly from accounting and finance. Um, but they usually actually do have kind of the most specific and the most difficult questions to answer when we're, when we're making those sorts of presentations. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> then we have a few more uh, practical questions here. 
that have been uh, posted in the chat box so far. Um, one, I think that it comes back to the issue of financial proxies. And can you talk a bit more about their, their accuracy? For example, the cost of a police salary versus the cost that includes infrastructure and operations of the police service. Do you attempt to, um, I know I've seen proxies for an emergency room visit. And of course, there's a whole host of potential indirect costs that can be associated with one visit to an emergency room or a trip in a, a call to 911 that might be um, made or avoided. And can you talk a little bit about how how deep or how far along you used to what you draw to calculate those costs? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're always in the practice of trying to um, make sure that we're not overclaiming and so always taking sort of the minimum value with the understanding that usually there's there's more to that. Like you're saying, you know, police time, is that just their wages? Is that all the equipment costs? Is that all the training costs and the administration costs? And how far out does that go? So it's really a matter of understanding what's going into that financial proxy, um, what sort of investment you're claiming against that financial proxy. So if you're um, claiming all sorts of in-kind and things like that, you want to make sure you're seeing that also in your financial proxies. Um, but always as well kind of looking at that minimum base value. So if we're going to assign a value, um, we usually look at how we can assign that minimum value so that you know that for sure that value is taking place and there might be value beyond that and that becomes part of the story where it's like we've, we've calculated this ratio and it's really a minimum ratio because it probably doesn't include all of those administrative costs or all of these different sort of aspects that are being potentially captured on one side with the investment and maybe not being seen on the other side um, when you're looking at that value that's coming out. Um, but to ensure that you're not overclaiming, I would always recommend kind of going with that minimum value. Yes, to be conservative in, in terms of the, uh, the claims. <laughs> yeah, especially because there can be some skepticism um, from investors or wherever um, around what those ratios are representing. So if you're able to then come back and say, we've gone through and we understand that police cost is probably a lot more, but we've just taken this salary cost because we know for sure that's what that value is. And the value is actually quite a bit greater. So then you're able to speak about that ratio in minimum terms. Okay. Um, some specific questions around the uh, SOI, SROI evaluation or accreditation. You mentioned earlier that an SROI evaluation done internally can be sent to the UK for assurance. Mm -hmm. Do you have a rough figure of what that might cost? Uh, I used to know. Let me just, I can look it up on the their website. But I think it's around 450 British pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but I can check that. Sure. Or I, I suppose anyone yeah. who. Uh, so if you Google the SRI network, um, they, they should have that all up on their, yeah, on their, their website. UK, the UK yeah. website. Great. Yeah. And uh, with respect to the accreditation training coming up in June, you mentioned that afterwards there needs to be an SROI uh, done to complete the accreditation training. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific time frame that that SROI needs to be done afterwards? No, um, there isn't a specific time frame. Okay, I've just looked it up. So it's 420 pounds for the assurance of reports and another 100 pounds if you're kind of going back and forth um, to make changes to that report and update it. Um, and then it's 750 pounds um, for the assurance for accredited practitioner status. So, and that involves a bit of back and forth with your lead assessor. Um, in terms of the length of time for doing those uh, case studies, there isn't sort of a limit, like you do your course and within a year you have to submit a case study. It's actually, I think, sometimes uh, beneficial for individuals to take the course and to get some SRI experience uh, working in a team or working on different projects uh, before putting forward that case study because that case study has to be, you have to be the sole author, you have to have made all those decisions and it really has to be kind of the highest level of rigor uh, going forward. So if you have some experience with SRI before that, you have some experience working through those decisions and figuring them out, and then you're able to put forward that case study, and it's um, easier, I think, to go through the process. Okay. Uh, here's another question from Seth Yatu. Is it possible to use SROI in a nonprofit, a microloan uh, program for women that wants to measure its social impact? Have you done anything like that? 
Uh, we haven't done anything specifically uh, with microloans, but it's definitely a possibility. Um, if those individuals are experiencing outcomes because of your program, then it's definitely possible to look at what the value of those outcomes are, um, especially I think in economic terms in the microfinance sort of uh, realm, it really translates quite well. Yeah, it sounds like it would be a good candidate. I know on our the evaluation resources webpage of our website, we have an example from the Calgary Immigrant Access Fund, which provides loans for immigrant to, immigrants to get qualification in their uh, professional training that they had in their home countries. And they did a return on investment for that, and their returns were uh, quite uh, remarkable. So it, I think it could be uh, expanded or adapted for microfinance or microcredit organizations, probably. Yeah. Uh, a question for um, from Maddie: Is there an SROI for a given value that also has a cost per unit value? Would you scope your value in the same way as the unit cost so that you have this, the same baseline? That sounds technical to me. Do you? Uh, yeah. So, that? is there an SROI for a given value that also has a per unit? value. Um, so I don't know, again, I'm not entirely sure uh, what you're asking in this question, but there is a, um, when you're going through the SRI process and you're assigning financial proxies, sometimes you will um, assign kind of a, like an incident uh, unit sort of proxy, so like an ER visit. So you might not say, you might not then look at the number of individuals who decrease their ER visits, you might look at the number of ER visits that were decreased, so the incident number, or you might look at what's the average number of times that um, a person now doesn't visit the ER per year, so maybe it's five times, so you do five times that unit cost and then the number of individuals who are experiencing that outcome. Um, so this kind of goes to the idea of what's the time frame of that investment, so if you've got an investment over a year, you've got a financial proxy that's just like a one month social assistance sort of thing, you want to look at that one month over 12 months. So you'll, you'll actually do a calculation based on that unit cost. Does that make sense? Is that, uh, is that sort of the question that you were after? That sounds like a good answer to me. Um, so it looks like there's a couple of people typing. We're just about out of time. Maybe I'll ask just one uh, last question around the scope of uh, applications possible, because obviously we have members involved in all sorts of different areas of activity. Um, can you give some ideas of the, uh, the scope of the financial proxy database, how complete it is, whether there might be areas that where there's still holes or areas that you think um, an SROI might not work? Um, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't limit the ability to do an SROI based on what's in the financial proxy database. Um, if, if those values aren't in the financial proxy database, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Uh, it just means they haven't been researched uh, or that we haven't come across that research and um, made sure that that's gotten into the database. So I wouldn't limit any sort of SRI work based on what's in that database. The database, uh, there's a lot, a lot of um, justice proxies in there, um, partially because of the safe communities work that's gone on in Alberta, and there was a lot of research around a lot of those uh, justice costs. There's also quite a lot of research around health costs that's um, available in the financial proxy database. Uh, a lot of those financial proxies are from Alberta and from Ontario just because of where the work's been done. A whole bunch are going to come in um, that are specific to Saskatchewan, and mm -hmm. we've been doing some work in New Brunswick where um, different deputy ministers there have talked about wanting to contribute to that financial proxy database as well. So it is kind of a work in progress, but as individuals do more SRI work and contribute those financial proxies, it'll just become more robust. But um, Lots of it sometimes is going out and finding that research and finding the most local sort of financial proxies that you can find or the best academic research that you can find around those costs, um, yeah, those different costs and values that you're looking for. Okay. So let's take one final question from Karen, which is a, I think, a really tough uh, technical one, and how, is how do you determine values for attribution, displacement, and dead weight? If we want to be rigorous, we would have to perform an impact evaluation or a control group comparison. Have there been 
sort of accepted methods, like in accounting, there's generally accepted uh, accounting procedures with SROI, are there generally accepted methods that allow you to establish those values? Uh, I think this is an area in SRI that's still quite under development, um, although kind of the ideal situation would be that control group comparison. If you have that possibility, that um, really indicates where, where change would have happened anyway and things like that, and you can really make those sorts of comparisons. You can use regression analysis. You can really figure those things out and tease those things out. Uh, if that's not a possibility, lots of times we look to best practice and um, kind of academic research around it. So if there's a similar type of program that's been researched, lots of times we'll go in and use some of that research um, and apply it to our programs to make sure that we're always presenting that most conservative estimation. We'll also go back to stakeholders lots of times and speak with them about what that change has looked like for them and whether we can ask them directly, do you think you would have made this change without the program? And see what their response is, speak with direct support workers around who they think might have made that change anyway or would have been on that path to change anyway. Um, and we'll also end up looking, like, if there's none of those possibilities, we'll often still include some sort of discount in there to say there's uncertainty and we're not entirely confident claiming that all of this change is entirely due to our program, and so we'll include some sort of minimal discount in there to ensure that we're not overclaiming and to ensure that the ratio that comes out at the end is really the most conservative ratio and that um, if different decisions were made along the way or if you were able to include more of that value or if you weren't discounting enough, that ratio would represent something else and would be bigger. Hmm. It sounds like uh, it's a, a relatively sophisticated, even though it's still a developing process. And I think it's really vital work as we continue to strengthen these approaches that um, not only attribute values and uh, to a, a wider range of, of what we value as, uh, as human beings and community practitioners. So, um, so that's, uh, that's terrific, Anne. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thank you, every, everyone, for your really great questions. So we're just about out of time. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, here are some links for the SROI Canada website that said that resource page that I mentioned earlier that has a lot of different examples, some SROI resources, but other types of evaluation resources, and the link um, for uh, SEDNET's newsletters if you'd like to register. Someone has just mentioned that the SROI Edmonton link isn't working. Yeah, and I just responded there. Um, a lot of those proxies, we took a, um, so SRI Canada went in and looked at a lot of that database, and a lot of that data ended up um, being translated into the SRI Canada database. So hopefully you can find some, some local stuff there. Good. All participants should have just received an email with the link to a one-minute evaluation survey. Please take a second and fill that out right now. Your feedback is very important to us especially because we have more webinars coming, and we always appreciate your feedback. Here again is our next webinar on April 18th, so you should register now if you're interested. And there are also many more events, webinars, workshops, and conferences being organized, organized by our members and others across Canada that are listed on our website calendar. So there's the link for our website calendar there. You can check that out. Finally, Many thanks once again to Anne for her thoughtful presentation today, and thanks to all the participants for the questions and participation. The webinar recording and the presentation will be posted on our website in the coming days, and we'll send you the links as soon as they're available. The webinar will conclude here, and participants who are interested in joining us for the reaction session can stay on the line, and I'll post the dial-in info for that in a few seconds. For those leaving, thanks for joining us, and have a marvelous day.